Excellency. You have spoken about your first priestly assignments in the United States. Please could you share with us your impressions of the United States in the 1970s and 1980s, which paradoxically appeared to be in the vanguard of modernity, whilst also providentially perhaps being in the vanguard of traditional resistance? Well, uh, f firstly, personally, I had an immense culture shock when I landed for the first time in the United States. It's a new world. And I would say the United States differs more from any of the one, any one of the European nations than the European nations differ from one another. It's a new world, uh, which inspired in Vorjak a very popular symphony, the New World Symphony. Um, then, what struck me, but you're asking about the 1970s, in, in particular in the 1980s, which of course was when I arrived. Uh, I, th I was just struck personally by the difference, the radical difference between the new world and the old world. And then I began, you, you, you mentioned Solange Hertz the other day, or yesterday. And it was Solange Hertz who put me on the track of what, what that difference, that huge difference is. Uh, she also, she was French, born and bred, but she married uh, an American serviceman who disappeared in the Vietnam War. He, he was just, I, don't, I think, she, she always said that she didn't, nobody knew what happened to him, but in any case, he, she became a widow with the Vietnam War. But she stayed in the United States herself and uh, until she died, and she only died, oh, maybe five years ago, I, I lose track. She, she was quite an old woman when she died, and she was, she was valiant, but there's no doubt about it. And she wrote very illuminating papers, uh, long essays on many features of the American scene and the Catholic scene, and she was definitely putting the two together. And when she put the two together, and I read a number of her papers, and I went to see her and got to know her, um, it's clear that the basis in the United States is quite different. So what struck me is the difference between the United States and Europe, rather than the difference between the USA in the 70s and the 2000s, let's say. Um, although I think that in the 70s and 80s, the, that was the time of Reagan, President Reagan. Uh, the United States was a lot healthier than it is now. It's gone downhill a long way. It's now dis the United States is now positively disintegrating, and it's the final comeuppance, as one as Americans would say. It's an American expression. The final vengeance of America's liberalism. Uh, in, in the United States, it, it, you, you you need the history to know to understand the whole thing. <clears throat> the, you, the English colonists beat out the French colonists in the north with the Battle of the Heights of Abraham, uh, and they beat out the Spanish colonists in the south, in Florida, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and so on. And therefore, the, Puritan, the English Puritans prevailed and imposed the 13 colonies, the 13 Anglo colonies, imposed their style and their nation upon what had been any French influence to the north and any Spanish influence to the south. Mark you, the Spaniards had, had marked the south, for instance, with their mission stations up and down California. But now those mission stations are isolated museum relics in the middle of Anglo suburbs. And the, Anglo, the, the Anglos have prevailed. Uh, there was a point in, very soon after the revolution in 1776 when the Americans were, were wondering, the, the colonials were wondering if they weren't going to adopt the German language in order to get away from England, uh, get away from the English influence. But the English influence was too strong and the English influence prevailed and the English influence was basically of Puritans, Puritans who turned into liberals. They turned into Whigs in, in England and they turned into uh, liberals in the United States. And that is the formative influence of the United States. 
and all of the problems of the United States can be, all of the serious problems of the United States can be traced back to the English Protestants. So the faith or the lack of it, the, the Catholic faith or the lack of the Catholic faith played a huge part in the formation of the United States. And the Protestants mu muted in, mu mutated into liberals and liberalism stamped the foundation of the United States, liberty, 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 the religion of liberty. And it was a religion, not apparently because God was no longer directly mentioned, but in reality, it's, it's, it, the, the worship of liberty replaced the worship of God. Not immediately, not totally, but uh, the, the religion of liberty, and it, was, it is a religion, it's liberalism. The religion of liberty was, was undermining the remaining religion of Christ from the beginning of the United States. And today, you've got anarchy. Anarchy in the streets. Last summer in the United States, you had these mobs raging through cities and rendering them, uh, turning them into chaos. The same may happen this, this, this uh, next summer. Who knows? Who knows what these people are planning? Because, of course, the mobs are not usually really spontaneous. They're usually organized, organized by the enemies of the present regime who are intent upon replacing anything of God or of Christian civilization with liberalism and their anarchy leading to their antichrist. So that was what, that was what I discovered soon after I arrived in the United States and uh, what I've seen from then on in the United States is this poison working, out, working itself out and coming to expression so that the, uh, the chaos today doesn't surprise me at all. I'm very sad about it because the Americans never had any proper Catholic roots Catholics came over as immigrants in waves, Germans, Poles, Irish, Italians, uh, uh, from, from Europe. And they did slow down the Protestant poison, but the, the, the Catholicism always arrived on a Protestant basis. The Catholicism always arrived on basic principles of religious liberty. Uh, religious liberty, uh, for instance, George Washington wanted the new nation, which he, he headed up to begin with, he wanted it to be religious. I think I said yesterday, he wanted it to be religious, but he, he also, it was impossible that, that from the beginning, it was impossible that the United, that the United States should have one particular religion because uh, the, the, the Catholics were, uh, to begin with, it was one religion of Protestantism, although Protestantism isn't one religion. But from the beginning of the United States, from the beginning of the colonies, it was not Catholicism. That they knew, and that, that was a, a key point. Uh, there, was a, there was a Catholic colony, Maryland, but it was one amongst many other colonies. So liberty, liberty, liberty. The religion, the real religion of the Americans from the beginning was liberty. So that you could be free to be Catholic, free to be Protestant. Free to be Catholic is good up to a point. But if you're only free to be Catholic uh, on, a, on, a, on a, a religious liberty basis, your Catholicism is undermined from the start. And that marks the Americans. So the Americans have never had the clarity and unity of the Catholic faith. Therefore, they're, they're relatively ignorant. They're ignorant of, that, of, of Christian civilization. They don't understand what it was or ever was. And they really believe in their new world, in their new civilization based on liberty. But if it's based on liberty, then Catholicism arrives on a quicksand. And it's never going to take root. And that's now the case in the whole world. All the nations now more or less imitate uh, the American nation. They all want the same material goodies. They all want the same material prosperity, the, the same political power, uh, or not the same, that's impossible, but uh, something similar. And so uh, the Masons have won. 
and the Masons uh, in America was found. The the the, the colonies were founded in the the thirteen colonies were founded in the seventeen uh, hundreds. In seventeen seventeen, Masonry began in London or broke out in London. And Masonry was only the 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 successor of a number of secret societies like the Rosicrucians and so on, um, the Templars. It goes back a long way. The fight against our Lord Jesus Christ goes back to the crucifixion. So uh, down all of these centuries, down these 20 centuries, the Americans have never known what Christian civilization really is because their civilization has really been a civilization of liberty, of which they're very proud. And they're proud that, that, that their basis prevailed at Vatican II, that, uh, that Americanism, it was kind of Americanism that, that, that their form of liberalism, which which triumphed with religious liberty at Vatican II, and they're proud of that. The, the, you know, the, those that, those that understand the least are proud of that. Uh, Americans in general are not dogmatic because they don't believe in dogma, because they believe in freedom from dogma. Therefore, any dogma that a Catholic, an American Catholic does believe in is limited in its, it's, it's undermined basically in his heart and soul because he has in his heart and soul, he has this, this worship of liberty. It's, it's, it's problematic, but it's less and less clear in the modern world because now the Catholic Church has adopted the same religion of liberty. It's a huge problem. It's got a lot to do with Freemasonry um, it's taken over modern history and it's now working out in the chaos of COVID and the rest of that. People no longer have minds to think because their minds are... Anything su substantial and, 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 and uh, stable in their minds is undermined by religious liberty. If, if liberty... If there must be liberty in religious ideas... How can, the, which are the most serious of ideas, how can there not be liberty in all other ideas as well, except things material, which is why they're materialists. Just as spirit, things spiritual grow soft and silly, in a manner of speaking, so things material become more important, and modern science becomes more important, because matter is determined. There's no liberty in matter. There's no liberty in mathematics. Well, you can choose in which direction you, you steer mathematics, to do, 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 do mathematical research and so on, but you can't change the nature of figures and what they do. Two and two are four, three and three are six, four and four are eight, and so on and so on and so on, and there's no liberty there. It's, it's, it's material and materialistic and, and quote-unquote scientific, and modern man is proud of his materialism, it's not, he's not at all ashamed of it, basically. It's what, he, it's what he worships. Oh my, it's a huge problem. And um, it's, it's, Catholics don't, don't integrate their minds. They, they, many Catholics, uh, and this was fifticism, they, they build a nice, sweet, religious religious world apart from material reality because the material reality is becoming too horrible without God it's been becoming horrible ever since Descartes and, and ways back and um, these problems were opened up in Europe but Europe had a lot of there was a, 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 lar a large residue of faith a, lo a long history many centuries of faith in many of the European countries, more in some countries than, than others, but in many European countries there was a residue of faith which set up a resistance to this takeover by material things, material and materialism. But in the United States there was no such resistance and therefore materialism and liberalism and religious liberty took over from the start. And uh, many American Catholics don't realize that their patriotism is against their real religion. And they're real, the real religion of true Catholicism is against, against Freemasonic, materialistic patriotism. 
And patriotism in the United States, at, from the very beginning of the nation, was attached to religious liberty. Therefore, the patriotism is vitiated. Same thing here in England, absolutely. Henry VIII did a number on England by turning patriotism against the true church. And the Armada in, in 1588, King Philip of France, a Catholic, tried to, made a serious effort to hold King England to the faith. But Providence allowed the Armada to be destroyed by storms and so on and so on. And when Philip II learned of the failure of the Armada, he had a te deum sung in the Ascurial, which means that he recognized the hand of God and, and England didn't deserve to be brought back to the faith. England had been given a chance with Mary, uh, Mary, well, Mary, um, Mary Tudor, Mary Stuart. Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor. I, I'm not too good on history. Of the, um, it was, and the, the, they threw it away. The English threw it away. They didn't follow. They followed Elizabeth, who was a, who was a cunning witch, like her father was a cunning tyrant. Oh my. It's a drama, drama. Men have free will. God gives us free will. He does not take away our free will. Only exceptionally will he override human free will. And if people want to go to hell, he will allow them to go to hell. And most men choose, most human beings choose to go to hell. The, the majority of souls are not saved, but they fall into hell by their own choice, not by the fault of God. And many Catholics can't see how things modern, how the modern world is radically opposed to their true religion. And the, many Catholics today don't have the religion of martyrs. Because if, if, somebody comes after, if somebody comes after us with a pitchfork and with a, a vial of poison or whatever, Oh, don't worry, don't worry, no, no, no I, I'm not taking my religion all that seriously. Don't worry, I really do like you and you like, please, you, do you like me? I promise not to disturb your liberal setup. I promise not to be a, a, a really awkward for your liberal religion. D d I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking my religion that seriously, please. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. You're a liberal just like us, that's fine. You have your, your masses and your this and that and your other, no problem. It's not serious. So, but there will, all right, Almighty God, God is God. And God will, even from this liberal mess, uh, conjure up martyrs. For instance, in, in communist countries, there have been a lot of martyrs in this, uh, in our benighted, in our terrible times. So, Almighty God is still working his will and harvesting souls for his heaven even in this scene, super poisoned by, by liberalism. Edmund Burke said that the most important of all revolutions is, quote, a revolution in sentiments, manners and moral opinions, end quote. The catastrophe of the 1960s seemed to be the concurrence of both the conciliar revolution in the church and the sexual and cultural revolution in civil society. Please could you share your thoughts on this concurrence and on the course and consequences of the devil's attack on marriage and the family? That's, that's two or three questions in one. Um, firstly, the 60s. The 60s were a terrible decade, a revolutionary decade. Um, I think I was saying yesterday, the 50s maintained the appearances of order, but behind it was worm-eaten. Uh, people were not really believing in the appearances that they were maintaining. I was saying the same thing about Winchester College. I had no idea when I was at Winchester College that this, I, I worked it all, I only sort of worked it all out m rather later. But um, Winchester College was the same thing. Those teachers who were decent men, they were good men, they, they did care for the boys and they did want to give something to the boys, but they had very little to give by way of real convictions or beliefs or faith, they had very little to give. And I was going to quote yesterday, uh, the, the headmaster, I went back to the school, maybe, I can't remember exactly, it must have been um, about 10 or 12 years after I left the school. 
And I think the same headmaster, the same headmaster was certainly there. So it was while he was still there, Henry, Sir Henry, Henry Lee. And um, I think I was quoting his real action to religion. You know, his, we got on the subject of religion. He said, well, religion is like a chessboard. There, and he rocked backwards and forwards in a very dignified and English way. You know, there are white squares and there are black squares, and sometimes you believe and sometimes you don't believe, which of course is the state of many an, the, the state of mind and heart of many an English gentleman. Uh, religion is, is is an optional thing. Sometimes it comes on, sometimes it doesn't come on. It's, it's not a very serious version of religion. But he said something else interesting. He said, when you were here, because I, was, I said I'd been there in the 50s. I left the school in 58. He said, when you were here, and he, he was there also in the 50s. And he said, when you were here, the, uh, the lower class boys imitated the upper class boys. But in recent years, it's the upper class boys who imitate the lower class boys, which, of course, is very true no doubt true, and very significant. The upper class had lost its lead, lost, lost, there was nothing there any longer. There, it was hollow. T.S. Eliot spoke about the hollow men, and Christian civilization was hollow, and it is, it's been hollowed out by enemies of God, who've worked deliberately to get as many, as poss many souls as possible into hell. And they've done a good job. Almighty God has allowed them to do a good job. Why? Because the, the presence of, of evil or the absence of good, which is what evil is, the absence of good uh, makes this life into a trial which only high-quality athletes, so to speak, succeed in, which means a very high quality of inhabitants of heaven. It's going to mean a very beautiful heaven in which God can take great joy. He's, he's, he, he weeps like the mother of God weeps. Their statues and their pictures weep for all the souls that fall into hell because each soul was meant for heaven, was capable of heaven. But uh, they, didn't, they didn't want it. They did not want heaven. They wanted to go to hell. Or they, they wanted... The, the causes, they didn't want the effects, they didn't want all the pain and hurt in hell, but they wanted the cause, which is the defiance of God. They, they, wanted, the, they wanted the cause without the effects. And the Lord God said, no, you take, you take the effects with the cause. You do what will deserve heaven and you will have heaven. You do what will deserve hell and you will have hell. You can choose between heaven or hell, but you can't choose to separate hell from its effects or heaven from its effects. Bossuet said way back in the 17th century, he said two inter at least two interesting things. He said, one, I, Bossuet, in the 17th century, when will Bossuet have died? He was a great churchman, um, not without his faults, but nevertheless, a great churchman. Uh, he may have died about, I'm just guessing, 1680. And he said, I tremble when I put my hand on the future. I tremble, je tremble, lorsque je mets ma la, la main sur l'avenir. He's seeing, he was seeing already what's coming. He saw, he could sense, you know, the French Revolution. He, did, he, he won't have pictured it, but he will have sensed that, it, that something like that was coming. And of course, it came. And it came because the French did not want the old regime. They did not want the monarch, but they didn't want the faith. They did not want God. That's the basis. Do people want God or do they want to get rid of God? Do they want to follow God's order and enjoy God's heaven or do they want to uh, get, or, do, or do, they, do they want to defy God? Lenin said, God is my personal enemy. And the other thing I was going to quote of Bossuet's, I've already forgotten. One moment, um, uh, no, I can't remember what it was, but that's, that's one quote from Bossuet. So the problem goes a long ways back. But what was your question again? You had three questions. Regarding the... The, uh, the quotation of Burke. Yeah. The quotation of Burke. Um, the, the revolution is really in daily habits. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was the strength of Gramsci's change of communism, Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci, the march through the institutions, 
um, in other words, go through the cinema, go through the films, go through the theatre, go through people's um, institutions, and when you get hold of their heart and mind through the institutions which nourish and feed heart and mind, you're going to have the people. Uh, he said, D stop. Stop the brutal communism because that simply gets the middle class all upset and angry and resistant. But get the middle class by their entertainments, by their religion, by their this, that, and the, by, by everything by which they live. And get them by what they live and, and you will have them. So there was a second question in between. The, um, the concurrence of the conciliar revolution with the sexual revolution. The, well, the, that's exactly Gramsci, so to speak. I mean, the, the 50s were a, a decade of decadence. Uh, and um, that decadence culminated in a serious collapse, both in society and in the church. A, a sea change in the society and in the church. You had the assassination of Kennedy, the Vietnam War, the 68 riots, student riots in Paris, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the, um, the Doors, uh, the triumph of rock music and, and, and a new style of music. There's a Chinese proverb, when the mode of the music changes, uh, the, city, this, the walls of the city shake. And that's exactly what happened in the 60s. And the, the mode of the music changed big time. You had the triumph of rock and pop and Elvis Presley and so on. Um, and it was the revolution in music. Uh, the revolution in music is you, you see in education. When, when a boy, uh, 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 let's say, a boy of 13 gets to his secondary school, uh, and he's been tidy and his jacket done up and a decent tie and, and correct. Um, but first, one of the first things is the shirt tails come out of the trousers and then the tie gets loosened and then the, the jacket gets... Uh, he was, but what, started, what, what all of that started with was rock music. He begins listening to rock, which is why parents should take great care what your music their children are listening to. And, and, and the parents should, if they can, give an example of listening to decent music, music that's got some order, that's got some dignity, that's got some purpose, that's got some, some sense of structure and a beginning and a middle and an end, not just this sloppy chaos or the sloppiness of jazz or, or whatever. You know, it, it's sloppy music, you're going to have sloppy people. Um, to have to correct people, P Plato in his Republic would have been very strict on the music that, that was allowed in the public, and, and he's right. And and um, a good tyrant will do what he can to uh, straighten up the music or to improve the quality of the music in his country. A bad tyrant will use the music in order to d deteriorate the people and make them easier to govern. So, uh, Ab Burke is absolutely right. And um, it's the little things that count. And therefore, in a, in a, in a good school, the, 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 the adults, with the backing of the parents, and they can't do it without the backing of the parents. Good education has got to be a conspiracy between the parents and the teachers and the um, priests, a, tr a, tr a triangle which, which encloses the boys and forces them to grow, grow straight. Girls also, a different triangle, but the girls also has got to go straight. Girls need women because only women will see through girls and men need, boys need virile men and they don't need to be taught, they don't normally need to be taught by women because women can't normally give boys the virility they need to grow up. Um, many In many primitive cultures, you'll never see the boys being educated, whatever education it is, by, by, by their mothers. They're brought to life, they're given life, they're nourished those first few decisive years by their mothers. The right hand that rocks the cradle rules, rules the world. But... After the time of the cradle, 
I think Mohammedans get older boys at about the age of four to hand them over to their, their fathers for, for virilization. So, um, uh, well, uh, say again what it was. Edmund Burke's. Uh, Edmund Burke, yes. And then there was a third question there. The, the, the concurrence. Yes, that that's it. On. The 60s were a disaster all, all round. And what happened in the 60s was that the decadence of the culture was eating away at the churchmen. And the churchmen had mush minds turning to television, turning, feeding on the media, feeding on the vile media, feeding on the prostitutes, as, as uh, Paul Craig Roberts calls them. Um, it's a sad story. They didn't have enough faith to resist the modern world and to resist its pernicious and subtle influence designed by the Freemasons and the devil to rot, rot men and finally rot the church, to get finally inside the church. The church resisted the modern world for a long time. The modern world broke out with the French Revolution. The church fought a magnificent rearguard action in France, for instance, through the 19th century. But uh, in the end, liberalism undermined the churchmen, and that was the end of the church, it, apparently. But there was, there was a resistance inside the church. For the, the, the main pioneer of the resistance inside the church was surely Archbishop Lefebvre. He was not the only one, far from the only one. But the, the one who set up the most successful and widespread worldwide resistance congregation was, was him. But he was working with fallible material. He was working with boys of the 1950s who already had the, the, the poison in them. And they, they were, we were, as I said to you, we were bewitched by the Archbishop. We followed him while he was alive, but once he was no longer there, with his charisma, with his very special power of, of, of attraction and leadership, very special, uh, once he was no longer there, the, nothing stopped them from sliding with the rest of the world, which I think is what more or less has happened. They, they maintain... The appearances are better maintained in the society, but I'm afraid, under the present leadership of the society, I'm afraid the game is up. They've joined the modern world it's in, in desire, if not in achievement. They would like to be even more approved, and they would like to be even more part of the system than they are. It's not that their faith is not strong enough. That's, that's the problem. The faith is not strong enough. How do you strengthen the faith? classic means of the, of, the, of, the, of the Catholic Church, the exercise of St. Ignatius. Those are designed to remake, to, to how can one say, it's, it's like um, boot camp, you know, boot camp in the army, a spiritual boot camp, the exercises, and they will put a man's faith back on his feet. They'll put a man, a Catholic man, back on his feet, which is what they did for for the next few hundred years. They were dissolved before the French Revolution. The Jesuits were dissolved. And they had to be dissolved because the Jesuits were such, such effective resistors to the Protestant liberal rot, the Protestant Masonic liberal rot, which was already well there in the, in the, in the, 18, in the 1700s, in the 18th century. So the, the, the Jesuits were, were the, the Pope was prevailed on to d d dissolve the Jesuits in around 1774. And then the re revolution took place. But in 1814, the Jesuits were put together again. And uh, they still did a lot of good work. But at Vatican II, the Jesuits were amongst the ringleaders of, of, the, of the decadence, of the rot. The, the Jesuits and the Dominicans were among the worst. The church is leaders in thinking normally, leaders in corruption, leaders in mental and intellectual corruption. How have modern women been tricked into pursuing power instead of love? I would say firstly, how have modern women been tricked into pursuing uh, power rather than love? I would say firstly by the example of the men. When the men alone are no longer men, the women are at sea. 
And and the men, if the men no longer want babies, if they no longer want children, if they no longer want descendants, the women are deprived of what they're doing, what, what, like American Airlines, what they do best, which is having children. They're, God designed women, womanhood, the woman Eve, for having children, for being the helpmate. That's the expression in Scripture, for being the helpmate of, of her husband and for giving him children. That's what they're for. If the men don't want children, which of course many modern men don't want, such is modern life, such is modern thinking, if many men, if men don't want children, then they don't w need their wives for the most precious function that they have. The women are all, all ends up, so to speak, are deeply frustrated, whether they realize it or not, whether they admit it or not, they're deeply frustrated and but they still need their husband, so they come to the office, they commute with him to the office, and in the office they begin to take over, because the woman has more will than the man has. Liberalism corrupts men more than it corrupts women, in a certain way, because liberalism attacks the reason, dissolves the reason. The, the prerogative and power of man, of man is his reason. The prerogative and power of woman is emotion. That's her privilege, her, her gift to love her husband and love her children. She wants, she needs, the, her heart is the center of the woman, the head is the center of the man. If you attack the head, you're going to bring down the men more, you're going to bring down the women. But if you bring down the men, then the women are at sea because they're designed by God to follow their men. And even when they're kicking against their men, revolting against their men, punishing their men, they're still following their men in, in God's justice because the men have betrayed them. So I, I, I think the answer, I, a lot of women's problem is, is men. And a lot of good girls today, good boys too, seek, look for good girls and seem to be unable to find them. But I think it's also very much a problem for the girls because the boys are often dishrags because they've got no reason, they've got no mind. They've got nothing to hold them and, and, and give them a purpose, convictions and some purpose in life to get to heaven. Nothing, nothing. All they want is to lie in a deck chair in the sun or whatever it may be, just drink all day or drugs, of course, strawberry fields forever. So it's, it's the men, the problem. You can see that in opera. In opera of the 19th century, often a woman saves man because she has, she, God gives her instincts, sane instincts. He gives her sane instincts. If she tramples on them and twists them like Lady Macbeth, come ye my mortal spirits, uh, unsex me here, fill me from top to toe, full of the direst cruelty. That, that's a terrible speech of Lady Macbeth, but absolutely modern woman. It's the devil. She calls upon the devil to take over, uh, take my mother's milk. What does she say exactly? I forget the exact. Take my mother's milk and turn it to gall. Oh, she, she's, she's, she's shrieking against her own femininity. It's a self-destruction, which is, which is terrible in woman, more terrible in woman than it is in man. M women basically are either better than men or worse than men. They're, the, the, so it's one woman, two, a good woman, one, a good man, two, a, a bad man, three, and a bad woman, four. Broadly, women are either worse or better than men. Broadly, broadly, broadly. Obviously, there are always exceptions. But they're different from men. They're profoundly different. And our stupid, wicked, proud, devilish modern age pretends that they're just the same or there's just a slight physical difference and that's all. No, no, a thousand times no, they're deeply different. Made profoundly complementary by Almighty God. And that's a husband and wife. And a, a, a normal man needs a wife to fill in his gaps, and a normal woman needs a man to fill in her gaps. The two of them fill one in, fill, are designed to fill, fill one another in, complement one another, to complete one another, which is normal. And, you, and boys and girls, women and men naturally get together. And then you get this terrible modern mentality, which means that the family is, 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 all, is all at war. And the man and the woman are at war with one another. That's, that's absolutely unnatural. Oh, my. So, again, what was the question? 
on how women have been tricked into pursuing power today? Um, they've been sold a bill of goods. They have been sold um, a mess of pottage like uh, Esau. Uh, they've, they've given away their birthright for a mess of pottage. Independence, pride. Pride. You're as good as the men. You've got to prove that you're uh, not only as good as the men, you need to prove that you're superior to the men. Nothing is better designed than to turn the men off the women and then have the women competing with them. Uh, it, and the poor women can't see it because there's, nobody's, nobody's telling them who, who they come from and what he made them for. Nobody's telling them. They're telling the exact opposite. So the poor girls and the poor women are just lost in, in the cosmos. I blame the men. But I was saying in opera, you can see it. Um, for instance, the flying, the flying Dutchman of Wagner or La Traviata. Uh, the instinct of the woman is to, is to even sacrifice herself for the man. Um, that's uh, Gilda in La Traviata. And um, it was center in the, in the Flying Dutchman, and in Wagner's Ring, Wagner really saw. I mean, this is a, this is nature still there in the nineteenth century. Saw the difference of uh, women between women and men, and his women are womanly and his men are manly. Uh, but the man is heroic, Siegfried, and so on and so on. Then the woman is, is womanly, and she also sacrifices herself, Brunhilde, at the end of the ring, and so on and so on. But, uh, but after a century of sacrificing herself for her man, after the wicked French Revolution, which liberated man, liberty, equality, fraternity, so the man is liberated from the bond of marriage. Bond is a tie, but a tie is the opposite of freedom. So if you, you worship liberty, you don't want ties, you don't want, you don't want family. And then equality. You don't want the man to be the head because the head is going to be superior to the heart. The woman has got all the gifts of the heart, the man has got all the gifts of the head, but the head is superior and governs the heart. Governs even while it's nourished by and looked after by the heart. But that, of course, means... In it, that means uh, so the head, the man being the head, is against equality. So you worship liberty, equality. You're going to destroy the old regime. You're going to destroy the old way of life. You're going to undermine the old way of life. And then you're going to have fraternity in order to put together a new artificial world without God. With nobody superior, with no monarchs, with no kings, with no, with no cardinals. Uh, Jefferson, the, the third United President, uh, said, you know, we, 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 we're going to show, I think one of his quotes is something like, we're going to show the world that you can do without cardinals and kings. It's liberty, liberalism. And that mentality destroys the family. You destroy the family, you're destroying the, the purpose and frame of the woman's life. The family is her creation. She, in a sense, creates a husband by the way in which she looks after him and supports him, which is tremendous. But the girls throw all of that away. And you see them, I remember in Wimbledon, um, out on the street, you could see in the, the early morning the, girl, the girls commuting to the office. They were independent, they were free, they were leading their own lives. They, they, had, their, their, they had their own little flat, possibly in Wimbledon, I don't know. They had no family and they were, they were liberated, emancipated. And what, did, what happiness did he give them? And you see them hastening. Uh, I had not thought done, death had undone so many to the, to the office, where they lead this artificial life of flirting with the men all, as best they can, prinking themselves up as best they can. No husband, no children. Oh, my, oh, my. And they throw away everything that a woman's life really should be. On the other hand, you could see in the afternoon the, the young mothers with a pram pushing a baby in a pram. They were much more fulfilled. Maybe they had a difficult husband. Maybe they had a difficult life. <clears throat> with the mentality of men today, it's very possible. It's not a husband. They didn't have a husband like they should have. But many of them had a more or less drinkable husband, undoubtedly. And they were having children. They were a lot more fulfilled than the poor girls going down to the office. That was in the park behind the house, whereas the street in front of the house, it, it gives a contrast. So women have, th have thrown away their femininity for a mess of pottage, for a mess of proud pride, 
Pride has got a lot to do with it. We're going to be the equal of men. We've always been submitted to men. We've been told by the church we need to be submitted. And it's true, they do need to submit because the, the heart needs guidance from the head. The head reasons and thinks and sees and guides and if the woman is wise, she lets herself be guided because she knows she needs to be guided because her reason is not as strong as the man, man's is. The, her strength is her emotions, her emotional capacity, her capacity for love, which to go, goes together with the need for love, which is why a husband needs to love his wife, which is what St. Paul says, which is what Scripture says, which is what God says. Husbands, love your wives, says St. Paul, and don't be bitter towards them. A man can be very cruel to his wife because she she hang she naturally hangs on him, and if he if he slugs her while she's trying to hang on him, and then you see in public, you see in the airports these 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 family fathers trying to behave as though they're still the lone ranger, you know, quasi alienated from their wives. Oh my, oh my, oh my! The modern world has gone so wrong. Poor thing. It's terribly sad and terribly deep and terribly grave. And it's, why is it so sad and so deep and so grave? Because it's God and eternity that's involved. And these poor, poor souls leading, misleading their human lives will miss paradise, will miss heaven, will miss the real purpose of their lives. And that's why our Lord and Our Lady weep. Because God is not imposing anything on anybody. He's proposing an eternity of bliss. It means a life of dis discipline here below for 60, 70, 80 years, but that's not all that much. There was a sister who died before dying, saying, it, 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 well, before she died and went to paradise, she said, it, after all, it wasn't all that difficult, meaning the Christian life, a relief, religious life. After all, it wasn't all that difficult, she said, at the end of her life. And she went to, no doubt went to paradise. Oh, my goodness me. We are now a few generations into the sexual revolution. How have young people today grown up without family nest varma? And what have been the effects of this deprivation? It's a generation of cold hearts, of cold boys, boys in, incapable of love and incapable of loving properly a, a girl who needs properly to be loved, and not just the physical side of it. Um, they've got, humanly speaking, almost no hope of conducting a healthy family life or creating a healthy family. Humanly, there's little hope. If a boy and a girl who are human, human wrecks, in a manner of speaking, from this point of view, from the lack of their own uh, healthy bringing up by a disciplining father and a loving mother. Um, and they need the discipline and from the man, mainly, and they need the love, mainly, from the mother. They need both. Never discipline without love, never love without discipline. But if they haven't had themselves a discipline, loving ba background, they, they can't give what they haven't got. Well, they haven't received the nest ferme, as you say, but which is in German the warmth of the nest. The warmth of the nest is crucial, and the grandmothers used to have it, and now of course the grandmothers are losing. The grandmothers used to be like tea cozies, you know, that they're, they're just all, so to speak, uh, made all out of wool. No, they're not soft or silly. They're not soft or silly, but they are made out of wool, and they keep the teapot warm, and that's what grannies used to do. Uh, and lucky the children that have got a grandparent, or especially a grandmother, to fill in for parents who no longer know. Parents have been out of the home. Their own parents have been out of the home. They both had to work. The Freemasons have fixed the taxes and fixed the, the life in such a way that the, work, that the family has to have a second salary. And they don't have the faith to, to know how to accept the poverty, the, the lack of money, which means that they will have, the mum and dad will have time and, and energy to look after the children and to bring them up. Boys need their father and girls need their father. Girls need their father for learning femininity from a man. 
um, because the man will they they, they 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 practice firstly their charms on their father and if the father isn't there it's not the same it's not as safe as if they practice their charms elsewhere in any case the nigger they're going to deploy their charms in order to find a husband and to build a family. Uh, the whole thing has just gone wrong. Um, so uh, it, it, the, 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 the problem gets worse today with each generation, which is why today in 2022, Almighty God must intervene before too long. It's happened before once in human history at the time of Noah. Men corrupted their ways, says Scripture. And Almighty God, the problem was so grave that he had to uh, flood, he had to wipe out mankind with the exception of eight souls. Um, and he had to wipe them out and start again with Noah, Mr. and Mrs. Noah, and their three boys, and, their three, and the boys' three wives, which was eight souls on the ark. And with eight souls, the Almighty God started again. It's not going to be exactly the same this time, but what is exactly the same is the universality of the corruption. The whole world is now dancing to the Masonic tune. And the Masonic tune is anti-God, deeply anti-Jesus anti Christ, which is anti-God. The, the Masonic way of life cannot survive. It cannot last it feeds on, on what it destroys, and it destroys what it feeds on. It feeds on remains of the natural and Christian past, and it destroys, as best it can, both nature and Jesus Christ amongst men. So it can't last. Many people have recognised the serious impoverishment of the Western artistic tradition and the uglification of public life, for example, in modern architecture. Please could you comment on modern art and what it bespeaks about the state of modern man's soul? The, the, arts, the arts are dead. M music, literature, uh, pictures, uh, les beaux-arts, the, the fine arts. Um, men need stories to teach human behavior and human they need stories as for examples they need pictures and they need music and those are the three main arts perhaps and all three today are dead and the reason why they're dead is because the artists the writers no longer have any god in their heart the musicians no longer have any god in their heart the music is cold jagged harsh that's what they have in their soul and they can't give anything except what they've got. What they've got is, is the larder is empty. There's nothing left. There's almost nothing left there. Stravinsky made fun of um, Vivaldi by saying he didn't write 750 concertos. He wrote one concerto 750 times. But the tunes and the music poured out of Vivaldi. He was a Catholic priest, in fact. Um, the, with the faith, music thrives. Uh, the same thing with the with the fine arts. The 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 abstract art is 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 the the manifestation of an empty heart, of an empty soul. There's nothing there. There's nothing positive there. It's all negative and jagged and hate hate. It's hating God. They've got nothing to say except I hate God. I defy, I make, as, I make as much ugliness and disorder as I possibly can. There's a very interesting book written about Picasso by a woman in charge of the Huffington Post with a, with a Greek name. I forget her name. Adriana Huffington. Yes, that's the one. Adriana Huffington. She wrote about Picasso. She said he had six main loves in his life. He loved a number of women. He was absolutely not uh, celibate, let's just say. Um, and each time he fell in love, there was a bit of beauty and order in his paintings. But then he got fed up with the woman and it all turned jagged again. And then he went on to the next woman of the same thing and the same thing six times down his life. And that's it. When, when there was some love in his heart, it wasn't love for God, but it was just love for a woman, which is actually, obviously, a ma some glimpse of the, of the beauty of God through the beauty of a woman. 
and love of a woman gives a, a, a glimpse of God. He had some, a little something to say, and he, he, he expressed the beauty of, of the woman. There were paintings that, he, that give something of the beauty of the woman. But after a little while, it just turns ugly again. It's very interesting on Picasso. Um, and that's a modern man, if ever there was. Uh, and he knew he was d doing ugliness. And he wanted to do ugliness because he despised the, the bourgeoisie. He said, they don't, the people, the, the, my, my, my patrons don't deserve anything else. Or my patrons want that. And of course, that again is true. The, the patrons of Picasso wanted ugliness and wanted disorder and wanted the war on God, which is always what it comes down to. They wanted the war on God, and that's what Picasso gave them. So that's the, that's the fine arts. And then literature, the same thing. Um, Solzhenitsyn is an exception amongst modern writers, simply because... Uh, in the in the prison camps, uh, the prison camp of Stalin, he found his way back to God. Like at the beginning, he was um, uh, an atheist, a, a classic Russian atheist. He was a good soldier in the Second World War, fighting against the Germans. And um, but he then made the mistake of criticizing Stalin in a letter. It got back to the authorities, and so he was sent off. I think it was for eight years to Siberia or to the Gulag which was the, the, the gigantic network of vicious, vicious prison camps, ugly, horrible prison camps. And it was there that Solzhenitsyn made his way back to God, just like, like Do parallel to Dostoevsky in the, in, the, in the 19th century. And those two are favorites of Dr. White, Dr. David White. There is some, still some literature because there's God, some God. God, from God we come, to God we're meant to go. God is what our lives are meant to be about. God is what our lives are for. But we have free will so that we can turn against what we're for and try to smash and break and f defile and, and destroy what we are for. But the consequences are that man empties his heart, he empties his mind, and he becomes... A pile of trash, so to speak. There's, a, there's nothing left. There's no dignity left. There's, no, no, there's just nothing left. He becomes... A tramp has more dignity than, than modern man who's completely emptied himself of God because the tramp may still have something of God in him. It's a huge drama, this war on God. It's the same down all the ages, in fact. It's just that in the modern age... Uh, we've, we're at the wrong end of a long process of fighting God. But the fight against God is there all the time. Uh, only many men have still have been able, down that long d descent, many have been able to see what's going on and to turn their hearts and minds back to God. And then, correspondingly, the arts revive. Uh, you, you know, you notice that in a chapel, when a, when a traditional Catholic chapel starts, quite soon the people the people want some Catholic music, a choir. Maybe they start fighting. You know, the the, the, the singers start fighting, the musicians start fighting. The musicians, yes, musicians, musicians, a special kind of people. But the beauty and the beauty of the Gregorian chant, the beauty of the the um, of the Church's music comes again to expression. On the contrary, in modern modern mass, you get these gu guitars and rock music and all the trash. The trash. The devil uses music to degrade human beings. God uses music to raise human beings. Because in any case, um, music is in human nature, and it's going to every man. You, Every man usually has some music in him, even if it's only bad music. But woe to the man that has no music in him. Shakespeare has a number of good, good quotes on music. He, he understood music. Tolstoy understood music and has some good quotes on it. And a whole short story, the Kreutzer Sonata, about the effects of Beethoven's violent music, which is the Kreutzer Sonata, the first movement of the Kreutzer Sonata. <sighs> wow, wow, wow. Um, but Beethoven still has a lot of order. So that in Beethoven, typically in Beethoven, when there's some, some violence, it issues in 
something harmonious and melodious. So that, you know, whenever you've got the jaws of the lion, out comes some honey. In, Be in Beethoven, there's still some honey. Modern music is the jaggedness and violence without the honey. The honey's gone. It's gone with the remains of the faith. But in, in the society of the in Germany, which was a rebuilding of the faith, a, a, a resurrection of the faith, the German Catholics, the German traditional Catholics, built a series, at least half a dozen, of lovely churches with, with a genuine artistic sense and a genuine beauty, because the beauty comes back with the faith. But no faith, no beauty. No faith, just ugliness. That's the uglification. It's a question of God, quite simply. Please could you tell us about Mrs. Sherry Merrin from the seminary as a figure who manifested the true fruits of femininity? She figures in the um, uh, lectures from the rector because um, she was the secretary of the seminary at, um, in Winona and she came there, arrived there to, be, to act as secretary soon after the beginning. She's built very solidly. She was married, ha happily married. Um, she never had children of, children of her own, but she did have nieces by, I think it was a brother. I think it was a brother of hers, no matter, or a sister, well, obviously, one or the other. Um, and these two nieces got, knew their aunt Sherry, and they found in her an ear. Aunt Sherry would listen to them, which a lot of adults today have no time to do for the youngsters. And the youngsters need adults to listen to them, especially the teenagers. They're growing up, they're, they're, they're having to locate themselves in life. They've got, they, they need somebody to listen to their problems as they, as they articulate them and then offer them some common sense answers. Common sense, what's that? Answer, common sense is the sense of realities that God implants in our nature to enable us to handle realities, common sense. And so it, it, it goes together with nature and both nature and common sense come from God. Now, if you're making war on God, you're gonna make war on nature and you're gonna make war on common sense. And therefore, you're going to, the, the adults are not going to take care of their children or the care that the children need. Not too much care, not too much love, no, not sentimentality, not sloppiness, not, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, I give you quality time, I'm giving you quality time, I'm giving you five minutes of quality time. Ah. What nonsense, absolute nonsense. Quality time, that's a weasel expression of, of hypocritical people pretending that they're looking after children the way children... Children need a lot more, a lot less and a lot more than quote-unquote quality time. Anyway, she took time. Love is spelt T-I-M-E. Real love is spelt T-I-M-E. Husband for wife or parents for children. So she took time with her nieces, and the nieces responded, and she, t she, get, she told them common sense. She did not wrap things up in sugar and spice and all things nice, which, of course, Hollywood does all the time. And the, this, Our trash culture is pretending to look after children when it's not really, it's not giving what children really need, because it has n no longer has any idea of what children really need. Children need discipline and love, never the one without the other. So, that's a very brief formula, but, but they need their parents. Children need their biological father and their biological mother. They don't need father number two, three, four, or five, or the mother two, three, four, or five. They need the original, their own true parents, their own, their own physical and biological parents. And they need the father to give them discipline principally, and the mother to give them love principally, the discipline and love that they need. Well, um, Sherry Mehran had no children of her own, but she did have common sense. She was a decent person, and she was a woman, and she didn't try to be a man. She didn't try to compete with the men. She looked after the seminary almost like a mother of, of the seminarians. Or she, she was the feminine presence inside the seminary, which always rightly, rightly 
handled can be an asset, an asset to a seminary. A seminary doesn't need to be completely without woman. It can, in their place, doing their work and being feminine, they can be a great help to the seminary, even a help to the seminary. So anyway, um, uh, she looked after these, these two, and they told the other boys and girls in their school, in their school down the hill. And soon, a number of the other boys and girls were coming up to consult, or to, they found her at home. They didn't come to the seminary, but, but they found her at home. And they, they responded to the time that she took with them and uh, the common sense that she spoke to them. Nobody else was taking the time and nobody else was giving them, the ch these children, these youngsters, these adolescents, nobody else was, was giving them common sense advice or very few people. She was filling a major need of these children. Then what? Then, then it, it came to a. Um, there was a classic case where um, a dozen of these, a dozen of these children. So, so she, Mrs. Merrin knew what was really going on in the homes, of uh, the homes, which are nice houses with a nicely cut lawn. But inside, it's divorce, it's child abuse. Above all the. The abuse of the children by their own father, by their own father, or by an uncle, or by a friend of the father, or and the father's attack either molest either their their girls or their boys, and then the mothers daren't say anything. They the children go to the mothers, and the mothers daren't say anything about it. They try to shut the children down. They pretend it doesn't matter or that it's not important, because what's the mother going to do? Denounce her husband to the police? She'll lose her husband, he'll be out of the home, and when he gets out of prison, he's going to come after her for having denounced him, and so on and so on and so on. So the mothers, and the, the mothers haven't the strength, or they haven't, many of them haven't got what it needs to stand up to the husband and straighten him out, or try to straighten him out, or take him to the police. And so the mother does nothing about it. They try to talk to the teachers about it, about being molested, it's pretty serious. It's pretty darn serious, because the fathers consider, I, I'm, I live in the land of liberty. I do what I like under my own roof. I do what I like, and nobody's going to tell me any different. And so I've got a pretty daughter, etc., etc., etc. And the daughters become pretty as they grow up. But and it isn't just the daughters; it's the boys as well. These men are barbarians. They've got no faith, no law, no God. It's, and this was, this, the letter about this goes back at least 15 years, something like 15 years, I remember. And what it came to a head in a way, what it came to, it isn't coming to, it's, it's, it's all the time. Um, there was a, a multi-criminal, what do you call them, a, a serial killer. Um, what was his name? I forget. And he said, he kind of repented before he was executed. He was electrocuted. In Florida, everybody in that morning turned off their toasters to make sure there's enough electricity to make the <laughs> electric chair function. You know, I, where's the, where's the, where are things coming to? The answer is civilization. Civilization is disintegrating. It's absolutely disintegrating. Anyway, this poor man, this, I say poor man, with the compassion, this serial killer did repent, and therefore he said it began with pornography. In his case, it began with soft pornography. It went on to hard pornography, and then it went on to action. And he said, there's many of me in every town in the United States. Because the, the, the whole culture is generating pornography. It's kind of living off pornography in a certain way. And the pornography is damaging, seriously damaging the psyche and, and opening up to evil the psyche of countless males, young males or old males. 
pornography. That's another, you know, you don't mention it. <laughs> God bless you. But um, it, this is what it was coming to. And so what happened in, the, in, in, in Winona, at the bottom of the hill, that 12 of these children being molested at home got together in a band with a leader who acted like a parent, who acted as a chief concerned for the other 11 and looking after them. And he took them in winter into the, fo into the woods where they set up little wooden shacks and, and, and huts or whatever it was, miserable little dwellings, but they were a family. And they were living together and they, they looked, cared for one another. And then the police would go in and bust up the shacks. Tim and Will to the woods. Where we shall find the inhuman beasts more kinder than mankind. Exactly. And when the police bust up the shacks, they simply rebuilt <laughs> Well, they came to Mrs. Mehran's attention and um, she introduced them to the seminary property down the hill where I never saw them. I never knew they were there and there was a kind of quarry and they, 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 they lodged there for a little while. But finally, she found, I don't know how she found or how she came across them, and a couple in Wisconsin, which is the neighboring state of Minnesota, a farming couple who had lost their two daughters in a crash, something like that. And she, she was in touch with them. I don't know how or why. She was in touch with them and said, how would you like to take these 12 children? And the, the couple said, yes, and we'll take them. And they took them and began to look after the 12 children. One of them died soon, a little girl, a girl of what? Maybe she was quite one of the youngest, 10 years old. She, she got gangrene, I think, possibly because of the winter and so on and so on. And um, she was, died in hospital. I don't know how it all turned out, but many of those 12, those 11 youngsters must since then have married. They've grown up to marry. They will have been, they were, I'm sure they treat the farming couple like their real mum and dad, because these are ones that, that really fulfilled the function of mum and dad, that has the old-fashioned common sense to bring up children, knew what children needed. That was the perfect solution. I, I say, I don't know how it turned out in the end. And it was through Mrs. Mehran that these children abandoned and pursued and harassed by our society, which is completely incapable of bringing up children, incapable of protecting children, with all kinds of hypocritical children's protection associations. Well, not necessarily hypocritical, except that it provides the, the elders with an excuse and the, and the ability to think, we're doing something for the children after all, when they aren't really doing what's really needed. They're refusing by their way of life, the pursuit of money. Dad is going to be working, working, working to get money, and mum is going to be doing a job alongside in order to get, in her case, maybe to get enough money to make the whole run. Had dad wants to accumulate money, or I don't know. I mean, I'm, obviously there are exceptions to all of this, but this is going on. This is what is going on. And this was absolutely current problem in the Midwest. And now, in the United States, the, 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 the New York East Coast and the California West Coast are notorious both for their liberalism. But the, the center of the country is supposedly conservative or more conservative. And here, in supposedly more conservative country, in a backwards town like Winona, which is a perfectly normal, decent town, supposedly decent, all the appearances of decency are still there, but behind those, de those appearances, ah, oh. I can remember once a sister of a seminarian visiting the seminary, and... Um, I was sitting down talking to her and she told me about, she came from Chicago, which is a big and prestigious city in the middle of the United States, but you've got the same liberal corruption there. And she said, back where I live, where I and my brother seminarian live, uh, we've got these lovely suburbs with immaculate lawns and handsome houses 
And she says, I could go down the street in a, in a car, in that house is adultery going on, in that house is incest, in that house... Every house she knew in her neighbourhood, she knew of some... Uh, again, that's an exaggeration to say in every house, but in many a house she knew of some serious immorality going on. And that's... I'll bet you that's the same for England. Basically, the appearance is one thing, the reality is quite another. It's, it's, it's Protestant hypocrisy. And now the Catholics are probably as hypocritical as the, as the Protestants, and they're as badly behaved. God have mercy upon us. What, what can you say? But people are not turning to God. And therefore Almighty God is, has got to do something like the flood. And that's what he's going to do. Only Our Lady in Japan in 1973, I always quote Our Lady of Akita because she said it all in, in two or three paragraphs. And she said there's going to be, if men don't amend their ways, um, there's going to be a punishment such as never been seen in the history of mankind. Uh, fire is going to fall from heaven, eliminating a large part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, the priests as well as the laity. And the survivors will be so desolate after the chastisement that they will envy the dead. In that situation, you've got two weapons, she said. The rosary and the sign left by my son. The sign could be the sign of Garibaldo, um, which, which was announced to the children of Garibaldo. Again, it wasn't said what the sign would consist in, but a, a big sign was promised at Garibaldi, bigger than the spinning of the sun and the Fatima, because it will leave some permanent record that people will be able to go and photograph. Fire will fall from the sky, eliminating a large part of mankind, the good as well as the bad, the priests. In that situation, you've got two weapons, the rosary and the sign left by son. And she says, pray the rosary for the Pope, for the bishops and for the priests. And that's where the problem is. The problem is inside the Catholic Church. It's the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And if the light of the world goes out, you're in darkness. And if the salt of the earth is no longer there to stop the corruption, that's what stopped corruption before refrigerators. If the salt of the earth has lost its savour, there's nothing to stop the corruption. And that's why corruption and darkness engulf us today. Because the church is, is ex like extinguished. The Freemasons have set about destroying the church and by the weakness and foolishness of men they've been allowed largely to succeed. And Almighty God has got to intervene. The situation is beyond human repair. Almighty God have mercy.